Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, so Peter told me that only eight people was going to be were, were going to be here. I prepared a talk for eight people, so hopefully it's going to be good for everybody. Um, so, a couple of a couple of disclaimers. So, first of all, um, this is the first time I give this talk. It's a, it's a new thing. I thought uh, this is the first time I come um, to to Russia. I'm going to do something new. So it's going to be a little rough around the edges, and I apologize for that. Um, and uh, uh, the second disclaimer is that this is going to be kind of a big idea, uh, big ideas kind of talk. I, I'm going to have some results uh, at the end, which are preliminary. Um, and we have done a lot of work before coming to this point, which I'm going to just sketch with some references. But this is really forward looking in the, what I think we're going to think about for the next uh, five to 10 uh, years uh, of research. And so, and I, I, I appreciate you all being here, and I, of course, thank um, uh, uh, Peter and Sergei for uh, organizing this. Uh, um, it's, it's a beautiful building. I really, I really love it. All right, so, um, uh, and the title is kind of, uh, you know, large, large, large theme uh, already. So, uh, first thing, I work for IBM Research. Um, how many of you are familiar with IBM Research? Um, there you go, a few, a few. Well, apart from those I've interacted with already, <laughs> who know? So IBM Research is the largest uh, IT research organization in the world. We're over 3,000 scientists and engineers. Um, we spend in research over um, more than the budget of the entire NSF, uh, at least as far as I uh, remember. So, um, and we are situated in 12 labs around the world. There's no lab in Russia, unfortunately, but maybe uh, in the future. Um, I'm not talking for IBM, just as a disclaimer. I'm located here in Almaden. Uh, it's uh, close to San Francisco, about 60 miles south of San Francisco. And it's a beautiful building in the, in the hills uh, of uh, uh, San Jose, south of San Jose, which was established in the 52 and dedicated in uh, 86. And we do a little bit of everything. It's a place where there are so many different things going on, you're never really bored. Um, we are very academic in our uh, scope. And in fact, in uh, the, our building has chartered the Nobel Prize and IBM has, has had several Nobel Prizes uh, in, uh, uh, along the years. Uh, and there are, of course, a number of notable uh, people in, uh, in my building. So these are people that have invented the database and things of that you know, uh, measure. Um, also, everything I'm going to talk about is part of uh, a larger research, initi research initiative I'm part of, which is called the Center for Solar Construction, which is a, an NSF-funded uh, science and technology center housed at uh, uh, UCSF, which uh, has people from all these institutions, San Francisco State, Berkeley, Stanford, and my group at IBM, and the, the Exploratorium Museum of Science. And if you want to know more about uh, the Center for Solar Construction, this is our website, and you have a few Twitter uh, things. Twitter is everywhere. Um, all right, so what do we want? What is this? Uh, what is the research that we want to do? Why do we want to go at? Why do we want to advance? And how do we want to advance synthetic uh, biology? So think about, think, think about in this, think about the problem in this way. So on the left here, I have a um, chemical engineering factory. So a chemical engineering factory is a place where you have a number of uh, useful inputs, chemicals usually, and it, while there is a, there are a number of processes that happen, you have useful outputs, right? Um, and the equivalent in nature of this chemical engineering factory is the cell, right? So the cell is an, a, um, a factory, let's say, that uh, processes a number of inputs, external or internal, um, uh, to produce a number of useful outputs, right? Um, however, within this analogy, of course, a rough analogy, 
um, what is important to uh, to uh, mention is that if you have if we have a an idea of what the chemical process that we want to process uh, chemical process we want we want to happen in our factory um, then we know exactly how we have to build this factory we know exactly what are the containers we need to put there what are the, the chemical uh, the, the chemical tanks where the chemical reactions are going to have um, for, for the cell, even if we have a complete understanding of the biochemistry, we have no idea. We have absolutely no idea how we have to engineer a cell so that it does, it produces something for us. In this, this idea that it has been processed for us of the blueprint of the cell, there is no blueprint of the cell, right? So we have the genome, but the genome, the genome is, of course, not the blueprint of what the cell looks like. So the idea of this research is to introduce a new scientific discipline, which we call cellular engineering, um, which aims of bridging cell biology with a lot of other disciplines like mathematics, physics, computer science, um, uh, in, to be able to design automated machines out of living cell in a rational mechanistic way, to basically establish the, br the blueprint uh, of cells as robots uh, for us. Um, now, in, in other words, what we, what we are aiming at doing is the following. So this is what we observe in nature. So four billion years of evolution are the, a, an imaginably uh, rich experiment that has produced a number of different morph morphology. We want to understand the general rules, the primitive folds that bring this morphology uh, to come to life so that we can produce something new. We want a unicorn, right? The unicorn can be our cell, our robot cell. Um, why is this important? Well, the impact of a, of a discipline like this is, of course, enormous. So at the level of the basic science, it involves, it bridges everything from computer science, artificial intelligence, which I'm going to talk about, image analysis, data storage, um, uh, analytics, physics, biophysics, the role of noise, statistical physics, uh, mathematics, a cell as a dynamical system, um, cell and molecular biology, of course, the process of cellular self-assembly, uh, network biology, all the biochemistry, genomics, and so forth. At the level of tools, uh, we think it will trigger uh, new um, uh, uh, technologies. Uh, um, uh, Computer-aided bioengineering is what I, what I mostly care about, but uh, also things in the, in the realm of large-scale simulations, advances in quantum computing, for instance. And at the level of applications, the sky is the limit from healthcare to think, think about uh, CAR T cells, like cell therapy, uh, drug discovery and drug synthesis, um, uh, boosters for the immune system, um, uh, cellular biosensor, uh, engineering for biofuels, uh, things in food production, anything we do to get today with cells will be accelerated and of course advanced by uh, if this this if we are a capable of building such discipline we have a <laughs> now I want to engineer cells I cannot even control my own computer because this, <laughs> this happened again like a few days ago while I was giving a talk at future biotech it's a poop popped up and so it's a anyway all right so um, uh, so yeah, so all this is, is uh, all this you know perspective, and a lot of what I've been uh, I will talk about is written in these two papers. Uh, one is uh, impressed in physical biology, and that the other is under review in nature, uh, machine intelligence. Um, right. So what are the potential applications? As I was saying before, maybe this we can skip. So from industrial assembly design to teach pathology, environmental sensing, bioremediation, so engineering bacteria that can eat pollution, whether uh, whatever pollution is. Uh, food protection and, and cell safety. So, um, how do we do this? Well, of course we can talk large, right? But in the end, we need to manipulate things that are alive, right? So, and cells are incredibly complex and intelligent nanorobots. They have very interesting, uh, very, very complicated internal uh, structures. They have both internal and external sensors. They can sense, they have perfect sensor. They can sense, um, I, I have some results that some of these cells that we have can go, can sense uh, environmental uh, perturbations billions of times uh, better than anything we can do chemically uh, today. And they have um, a very complex uh, uh, biomolecular control system, all the pathways that we are familiar with and we study in, uh, in biochemistry and genomics um, are related, of course, to uh, 
uh, to these two other levels of, in, of investigations. However, uh, and, and um, so the goal of cell biology, as we know, is to relate those levels, so to relate the cell, the, the molecular state to uh, cell behavior. And when we think about molecular state, we are thinking about um, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of chemical reaction, reactions happening either simultaneously or in an order that has been tuned by billions of evolution to achieve a specific function. Uh, a function that is uh, perfectly uh, described by the phenotype. It's pro is, it, is it producing something? Is it eating this? And, and so forth. So we can simplify saying that molecular X is required for behavior Y, right? And what everything we know is we need to modify this, uh, this network in order to achieve something specific. However, we don't do it. We can't do it. It's impossible, there is no single technology that is capable of monitoring all uh, that happens inside the cell, right? So there's, there's no single technology that tells us everything that is happening inside a cell, that monitors all these chemical uh, reactions. There's, there's no predictive understanding of how the modification of this is uh, reflected on what happens at the cellular level, on the behavior of the cell. And, and the reason for that is that Molecular and cell biology means translating something like this. This is a very typical example of a network interaction map into something like this. So it's a cancer cell, for instance, or a cell that is producing something for us, or a cell that is interacting with the, with the environment in a specific, specific way. And so, with, again, within this uh, way of reasoning, um, there are other disciplines that are like this, drowning in detail. Any of you? thinking about one specific, well, I'm going to give you an advice. Computer science. So computer science is itself driving in detail. So, so um, we start from, uh, you know, a, a, a map of uh, the, uh, the transistors or uh, we, we could go e even further, you know, the, 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 the silicon, the material, and then we get uh, mi almost miraculously, miraculously something that is visual uh, on our computer. And what, what, of course, what is, what, what is happening here is there are a number of uh, steps in, in order to reach this. So we, we go from the transistor to the, the gate logic, to the register level, uh, down to an algorithm, which is something that can take everything like this and integrate it into a number of instructions that can become um, what we're what we looking at. And so the question here is, are we looking at the light, right level? In order to understand how this goes to this, do we need to look a little further up, maybe? Do we need to have a different view of uh, um, synthetic, of, of biology that allows us to design cells that do what we want? Do we need to abstract a little bit more uh, above the, the basic transistor level before arriving here? Um, in order to achieve what we want. Can we engineer a cell just by looking at it? Can we engineer a cell just by learning how it looks like? And so the idea uh, that we want to push is uh, we need to go to, we need to think about it, uh, about the you know, synthetic way, how to design cells, how cells assemble themselves in different ways. I'm going to make a number of uh, examples here, and then I'm gonna go deeper into what it means designing a cell, and then I'm going to try and give you more specific details on what our approach uh, will be, and then I will finish with a couple of examples. This was a very short, uh, a very long first slide, right? <laughs> a multi-slide first slide. Okay, what would, the, what would a cell look like if a computer designed it? So, do you know what this is to the left? I'm sorry? So this is called a finite state machine, or a, a cellular automaton in this case. So it's, a, it's the simplest uh, abstraction of a computer, sci the computer scientist uh, has done of a cell. It's, a, it's basically a self-replicating system, which has a program. Uh, it has a, uh, a structure that copies the program. Um, it has compartments, and, it, and then it has a controller. So it has something that checks if, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, if the other, if uh, everything else is going well. Um, 
And this, as you can imagine, this is the simplest, simplest way we can, uh, uh, we can look at, we can abstract a cell. Now, if I, if I were to design a cell as a computer scientist or a physicist, I will try to start from this and then go up. How up do we, can, how, how up can we can go? How much in detail can we, uh, can we go in the reconstruction of everything that happens inside a cell so that the computer can understand it? Well, the opposite case, in my opinion, uh, is a whole cell modeling. Can I codify everything that happens in a cell in a computer and then ask the computer to run all the software for me and, and get interesting results? And so this, is, this comes from a very interesting paper that the group of Marcus Covert in Stanford wrote a few years ago. It's a seminal paper, seminal paper, seminal paper. Um, what, uh, what they did was to um, try to codify everything that was known about uh, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, the biochemistry of a, a cell of a very simple pathogen uh, and then uh, put it in a computer and then use dynamical, use com uh, computational, you know, computational biology to simulate forward um, um, the, the state of the cell. So at every instant, you would have um, every pathway codified here give you uh, a reporter, give you a, an output. And this would be, uh, for instance, the level of a certain protein. It would be uh, at, at the, the deepest detail you can imagine um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, that is known. So which one of the two do you think is the best? Well, so this is, of course, very complete. However, um, as you can imagine, it strives to get to a level where a, com a complete understanding is not there, right? So we don't have a complete understanding of how the cell works. And so the fact that, we, that some things are unknown here is, of course, a big limit. On the other hand, this is uh, too simple for um, the, 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 the actual emergence of cellular life. There's no cell that is like that, at least as far as I know. Maybe there are. I don't know. Um, so, and in fact, a cell is, a, as, you, as, you, as, you, as you very well know, is a much more complex uh, object where there are a number of compartments and these compartments have been, have been put there by evolution to keep chemical reactions separated. Uh, um, and in order to design one of these things, we need to know more. How much more do we need to know? Well, we go the, the, the whole cell um, modeling way, I think, we still have a, a number of gaps in our knowledge. So, first of all, uh, the uh, uh, cellular processes and interactions are multi-scale. So they're not only happening at one level, but they're happening at different levels. While th there are chemical interactions uh, um, at, at the level of the single pathway, there are physical interactions among the organelles, there are uh, me mechanical interactions between cells and so forth. Um, not only that, when we decide, when we want to synthesize something, we are, of course, uh, thinking about, we're, we're, of course, playing with something that is alive. And it, this, this, uh, this uh, uh, cell may produce things that are unanticipated. Uh, so, and and we, we have no idea. So there is intracellular production that may be stimulated by changes we do uh, to the cell that are unanticipated. Um, we don't know enough about how the cell organizes itself. So what are the relationships between the different, par the different parts of the cell and how they play into the, uh, the, the fate of the cell, whether the fate is a specific phenotype or apoptosis or whatever, it's irrelevant uh, at this point. And this is absolutely unclear. And we don't, we don't even know at what level we need to study self-organization. Do we need to study it, it? Do we need to study it at the level of the whole cell, the cellular architecture? Do we need to study it at the level of the pathway? And what we do now is drown again into the details. Um, this is something that's very dear to me as a physicist. Um, while in physics, noise is a bug, using a computer science uh, um, uh, jargon, in biology, noise is a feature of the system. Noise activates pathways differentially when, uh, when we need, but we don't study the role of noise in biology enough. In physics, we have a whole discipline that has gone on for hundreds of years now, that is statistical physics, that deals specifically with the role of noise in physics. Theory, books, I mean, you know, the, the, 
you, the Russian school of statistical physics is unsurpassed yet, right? So, right? So I, I say this because I'm here. If I were in Finland, I would say the Finland school of <laughs> <laughs> statistical physics is, you know, uh, of course, it's, uh, I'm joking. But no, but it is, it is true that there, are, there is a whole discipline dedicated. We don't have the same for biology. And yet we, 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 tend, we want to understand, the role, we want to understand um, how subtle changes in uh, protein expression, for instance, in the gene expression, um, um, act on cell fate and you know, think about P53, right? That's the, and the last but not least, evolution. So this, so everything, everything here has a purpose. So um, when we want to design something that does a specific function, we are working outside uh, the real mobile, we, we are working in an experiment that may have been attempted and it probably failed or we have not discovered yet. And so um, we, need to we need to keep this in into account. Um, uh, so what this means is there are very few rigorous uh, design principles or even general strategies of synthetic cell biology that are beyond trial and error. So I just try, right? actually this is, a, so I, I talk to people that work in this field as a profession. And uh, what they tell me is that they have a construct, they try a small modification of this contract, and the, uh, con uh, construct, they try it, right? And if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, they throw it away, right? So this is hundreds of thousands of dollars that go literally down the drain. So we need to, deal, to do a little bit better. Now, you may think it's hopeless, right? Well, this is not true. Synthetic cells are, are uh, possible. Actually, I don't have it here, I forgot to put it, but just a few weeks ago, there was a beautiful paper on PNAS um, that described how you can engineer a, a synthetic robot. So if this is a robot made of, um, uh, now I'm going to butcher the, the biology, made of uh, interacting frog embryo cells that were programmed uh, so that they will do specific simple functions that were not, uh, were not in the original uh, uh, code. But you know, if we go a little bit back to the literature, we can design uh, synthetic yeast, or we, and we're working on designing synthetic bacteria. Uh, there are a number of uh, experimental approaches, like you know, uh, forward DNA engineering. You create the the uh, the the, uh, the structure, and then you have it uh, 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 produce, or uh, um, you remove superfluous gene and you try to assemble it so that uh, it works. Uh, uh, it, it still works. You see how many you can you can remove before it doesn't work anymore. So please pardon me a second. Um, not only that, so, but we need to appreciate that cells are dynamical systems, right? So they are never steady. Um, every cell going uh, into more of the formalism that is uh, proper to my training. So cells are, um, the function and the state of a cell is a point in some kind of multidimensional space where um, every direction of this space is a feature. So. Um, uh, for instance, one feature could be, is it producing something? The other feature is, what is it, its area? The other feature could be, I don't know, does it have nu a nucleolus and, and, and so forth. Every cell is a projection in this multidimensional space. Um, it has time and space dependence. We, go, we look across multiple cases, many variables. A formalism for all this exists and it's called systems biology. Systems biology focuses specifically on uh, uh, although it's uh, presented as a systems view, it focuses specifically on modeling uh, pathways and the networks of, uh, of pathways um, so that they, uh, they can be modified. And I'm gonna show you an example of this. Uh, so, um, and, and here I want to go a little bit more in details on what we want to do. So given that there is such a, an, a, an enormity of information, uh, and given that, you know, we need to find a balance between a, a cell that looks like a cellular automaton and a cell that looks like a, uh, um, a, a, a bunch of biochemical reaction for which we need to know everything. What we propose is a level of abstraction that looks, it's very simple actually. When I say this, I, I'm surprised that nobody thought it before us, is a, um, is a way of, of uh, trying to understand the uh, design principles uh, uh, from cell just by looking at them. So, but just by seeing how um, uh, they assemble themselves. So what the organelles do in specific uh, things and trying to infer design, uh, design principle from cell morphology. And this is outstanding, I mean, um, uh, astounding, the fact that 
while, while I was presenting before that we don't have a single technology that is capable of monitoring all the chemical reactions that happen um, inside the cell at the same time, we do have a technology that is capable of showing us, of telling us uh, what the cell looks like at any step in time. And it's microscopy. We've been, we've been doing it for hundreds of years. Um, so how do we design cells? Well, imagine that we want to establish a, a blueprint of the cell. Um, if we want to look, for instance, at this intermediate level, coarse grain view of the cell, and extract design principles, uh, principles for it, what we are uh, thinking about doing is writing a program that basically uh, um, tells you in a predictive way relationship between structures inside the cells. And then, of course, don't, uh, don't think that I'm... Uh, um, under, uh, that I'm under complicating this. Uh, of course, we need to go to the genetics, right? So to, in order to modify the cells, we need to rel relate this state to the genetics. This is just an, in, uh, uh, an insect. Um, but we want to fo what we want to focus on, instead of looking at the network biology, we want to focus on what the, uh, the relationship between morphology and cell state and function at uh, any point in time, so that we can build uh, models that relate uh, in a predictive way this phenotype uh, to this phenotype in, in, uh, in, in this space. Um, how do we do this? Well, so the, the idea is that at some point we want to be able to get to what is called a cell CAD, computer-aided design, right? Computer-assisted design, computer-aided design of a cell. And we think this is going to be a combination of uh, two different approaches. A, a, uh, model-driven model, uh, design of cells, which is basically what systems biology does. And so uh, um, we, we codify a, a mechanistic model of uh, how uh, uh, of um, uh, the, either the network biology of at, at the level of abstraction that we have uh, the um, uh, the organelle biology. Um, we we simulate forward in time this coarse grain model in order to obtain a phase space where uh, uh, we we have. Um, uh, prediction in silico in the computer of uh, um, uh, wh wh what the features are as a function of the parameters that we use. Then we change the parameters and we do it again. We do millions of times until we map the whole set of relationships between, uh, between uh, these features. And then maybe we are interested in this, uh, this one here, for instance, if this is mitochondrial size, uh, so mitochondrial connectivity, and this is vacuole size, we want something that has low mitochondrial connectivity, high. Uh, sorry. And, and we go to design. The uh, problem with this, of course, a, a, if you have done any of this uh, 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 systematic modeling, is that uh, in, in order to have, um, as a, if, if we look at the level of um, the, the network, the network biology, many times we don't have a whole, as I was saying, the whole knowledge. This means that these parameters sometimes are approximations of what uh, really happens in nature, or maybe they are difficult to to modify experimentally. And so this is, of course, is limited. And this alpha may be nothing we can measure or modify uh, experiment experimentally. So one thing that it, it has not been tried so far, and also this uh, surprised me a little bit. Well, what if we tell, we ask biology to tell us what are the design principles? And so this is um, what we can call a data-driven design of cells. So we, we can analyze a, a large number of perturbations, at either at genetic level or a, a chemical level. Uh, uh, by microscopy, then we can characterize the phenotypes in this, in, as displacement in this large phase space where, you know, again, one direction is what they produce, one direction is how they look like, so, for instance. And then we achieve design target by summing displacement. So, for instance, if we, if we uh, want to go from here to here, then uh, we want to understand which mutations uh, uh, bring us there. We, and, and this, as uh, simple as it may sound, bring us a, a, a number of in interesting theoretical problems that if you want to do computer design, computer synthetic biology, we need to understand. So are organelles individually addressed by mutations? So is the one mutation responsible for a single organelle? Uh, is the morphology space a linear vector space? If we combine two mutations, are we going to have a summation? Or are there other things like, you know, are there um, epistatic interactions in some sense? So non-linear relationships uh, between uh, mutations that derive a different morphology. This is something we need to understand if we want to, uh, to, to know. A roadmap of this could be, again, as I was saying before, we get a bunch of cells, we extract a, a, a feature space. This is a real feature space where uh, I've mapped several uh, populations um, in, in a three-dimensional space. This is actually a 131-dimensional plankton morphology space that I uh, designed some time ago. 
And as you can see, different plankton populations map in different ways, right? So, and now imagine that this is, and we have done this for, of course, for a number of different systems. Uh, imagine that each of these is a different, uh, um, is a different mutation or a different chemical perturbation. Then you, you can infer now a dis design principles just by extracting models using algorithms in order to be able to predict optimal design choices. Uh, so how to do that? Well, uh, the first, first thing first, so this goes back a little bit to what needs to be done. So the first thing that needs to be done, we need to be able to get precise cellular quantification. Uh, or, um, and so since uh, uh, we started this project, most of our work has been on um, trying to image cell and get information from cells in the most accurate way with the, most, uh, with the state of the art technology. And so we have a number of papers, uh, uh, some of these are work in progress, some of these have been published on uh, detection in 2D, 3D segmentation in 2D, 3D, annotation of very large data sets, um, uh, classification using supervised and unsupervised machine learning, uh, deconvolution, uh, neural network tracking, uh, and so forth. So what we needed was, well, once we have a cell, uh, if we can stain it, and we can stain it because we have um, years and years of uh, uh, of microscopy, we need to be able to quantify. And so first thing first, we need to have algorithms to quantify. So we have spent a lot of time uh, to, to do this with, with uh, some success. Now, uh, the next step is going to be to, to try and build this relationship for design. So can we infer design from, uh, from data? And I'm going to give you now two examples of, how am I doing with time? 10 minutes, all right. So maybe one example, how about that? One example on how to, uh, to go from data, uh, so, so the way we're, and these are simple examples. This is the basics of what we want to do. But we have um, very large experiments done, a, a large set of data where we want to apply some of these simple things uh, uh, combined. I'm going to show you an example of inference of um, uh, genotype to phenotype mapping for a single mutation. This is something that it's actually um, very simple to do. I'm going to show you how to do it large scale efficiently. So here what we have is, uh, this, is a, this is a yeast. Uh, these are yeast cells, uh, so just standard yeast. We, we have uh, stained the vacuole. Um, the, what you see here uh, in color is a 3D mapping. So these are 3D images which we have flattened and the, the, 3D ma the, the color mapping is 3D. This is going to be a feature of our uh, system. We have eight knockouts, uh, and we have about 3,500 uh, 3, images. So what we want to do is try to understand the relationship between uh, genotype and phenotype. And the first thing we observe is that different knockouts uh, actually have the same, may, may have the same morpho morphology. Now, remember, what we want to do is to design a cell that has a specific state. So in this case, our, interesting, uh, our state of interest is the phenotype, right? So it's what the nucleolus look like. And so we have, um, we, our, with our colleagues uh, uh, at UCSF, we have, uh, they have identified for us four different uh, phenotypes. Um, it can, we call it condensed, but this is basically the vacuole has exploded. Uh, positive, single vacuole, negative, no vacuole, and then two or more, or more uh, uh, vacuoles. And this is at least four morphologies. Now, um, the formalism that I'm going to use next is machine learning. Do you know machine learning? A little, oh, you all know machine learning. All right, so maybe this is, I, I, put, I put these slides last minute because I thought maybe, maybe I should introduce. Okay, so machine learning, uh, classical sport vector machine, set of algorithms to access models from raw data. And so support vector machine usually needs or assumes a model, linear, you know, linear regression, uh, uh, logistic growth, so forth. All right, so learn, linear separation. Um, deep learning, are you familiar with deep learning? All right, everybody's familiar with these new things. Um, so deep learning algorithms are a set of layered algorithms expressed in terms of, of, of very, uh, of simple units, simple units, neurons, right? Uh, and the, um, uh, the, the powerful thing about deep learning is that it does not need a model, but it builds uh, models out of associations between these neurons. If you're curious about this, it's an excellent book uh, by Goodfellow and, uh, and uh, co-workers. Uh, on, on deep learning. And um, 
Deep learning is a part, is part of machine learning. This, is, this comes from the, that book. This is artificial intelligence. And as, if we, as we go forward in the level of details, we get things like you know, logistic regression, machine learning, uh, or representation learning, shallow out encoders, if you are so technically inclined, or things like uh, deep learning, uh, artificial neural network, and, and so forth. So what we are going to do is to uh, use um, machine learning together with deep learning to get extremely accurate uh, segmentation uh, of, uh, so exactly quantification of these cells in order to be able to associate uh, them with, uh, with their uh, genotype. And in this case, I'm going to use what is called unsupervised learning. So in this case, we ask a machine, can you learn by yourself what the uh, phenotypes are? Um, and this is uh, uh, in contrast with what is called supervised learning, like um, deep learning, where you have to tell a machine, this is, uh, you know, this is what, um, this is an example of uh, a diffuse vac vacuole. This is an example of a single vacuole, and so forth. Uh, and of course, there are pros and cons. I'm not going to go into details. But um, so uh, again, so what we're going to do is to use this to, we are going to ask the computer, can you tell us how many different kinds of cells uh, you see? We don't trust our biologist friend. Sorry, Raul. Uh, no, I'm, I'm joking. But what we want to, want to see is, beyond our understanding of the biology, are there um, subtle features that the machine can identify that are uh, um, more complicated uh, uh, to see by naked eye. And then we're going to apply a, a deep learning based uh, uh, segmentation algorithm. We're going to um, extract features and then ask the computer to do association between the two things and, and try to go to uh, the, 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 uh, the bottom of the problem. So uh, first problem, uh, we have, uh, these, are, these are our cells, sometimes our Horizontal, have you ever used image J or cell profiler? Yeah, so you do uh, horizontal segmentation, single threshold segmentation, it doesn't work. So what you need to do is use what is called deep learning. Um, this is what I was saying, is layered algorithms that run one after the other, that uh, try to take these large images down into a network representation. And then once they are at this point, this is called decoder, uh, 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 it's called encoder. Once they are at this point, they decode the information. And so using this, uh, this, uh, this construct, uh, we can, um, and giving examples uh, of, uh, of the cells to, uh, to the computer, we can get uh, very accurate uh, seg segmentations. So this is, so if you try this with any algorithm that is out there that is non-deep learning, there's no chance you get something, uh, uh, something this precise. Uh, and this is using only 100 cells for training, something that anybody, a graduate student, a postdoc, even I, who are less than a graduate student, can do. So, um, so very good, very good segmentation. So now, first thing, we wanted to use unsupervised learning. Now, we need segmentation, we do deep learning. Um, from these images, again, remember, so we need to map this into this feature state. So we extract features. We have 131 uh, features that we have encoded. Um, there, is a, there are other ways of doing this. We have done this by hand, but there are automatic ways of uh, getting uh, features. So these are basically descriptors of how the cell will be translated into machine language um, that a, a machine learning algorithm uh, can, uh, can use. And now you cannot re really read here, but there are morphological features like area and perimeter. There are uh, image analysis features like who moments and Zernike moments and uh, things that are a bit more complicated, like Fourier descriptors, which are shape descriptors, and, and, uh, and, and so forth. And so, um, let me skip this, because we don't need it. Um, now, so, um, now, okay, we have taken all these features. Now we ask the, the algorithm, um, can you identify, um, can you separate these um, cells into this feature space? So, let's now, put all the cells in this special phase. How many do you find? Well, the algorithms, in an unsupervised way, finds four clusters, uh, and each, each cluster uh, maps exactly to um, what, we, what our biologist friends predicted, uh, with about you know, 85%, 85, 86% uh, accuracy. But what is more important is, this has no information about the genetics, right? The gene I never talked about the genetics. We have eight knockouts, right? And we have separated the phenotype. So what we can do now is to um, associate uh, the, the phenotype to the genotype. So um, this is uh, class one, so diffused. Uh, these are negative, these are positive. 
uh, and so forth. Now, that, now, what this is going to is, if you now replicate this with all the eight uh, genetic modifications, you have a map of what is the most probable, um, uh, what is the most probable phenotype associated to a specific genotype. Not only that, but you also have an information about all the other phenotypes that are associated with a specific mutation. Why this is important? Well, it is important because in some cases, some of these phenotypes, if for instance, some of these phenotypes are related to a specific um, perturbation, um, they may not be achieved. And so in order to design a cell that does a specific thing, we may need to resolve to a different uh, perturbation. And so this allows us, again, if you map this in a large database, it allows us to establish design principles um, for, for, for cells uh, as uh, machines. Now, this is very simple. This is only one perturbation. Can we predict combination of mutations? Now, I'm gonna, not gonna tell you this because I'm out of time. Uh, I'm sorry? I know, that's the most, I know, it's the most interesting part, but, so, uh, all right, so let me, let me see, let me see if I can do it in five minutes so, so that you don't, you're not too bored. Um, so, can, can we now try to identify, uh, can, try to predict combination of mutations? So, um, we have now a system that has two different mutations combined into a single phenotype, which is this cancer phenotype, uh, and we are, we are uh, using four organelles and, and, uh, Four conditions. So we are using a control cells, no mutations, and then we are using single uh, transfections with uh, these two um, uh, oncogenes, uh, MIC and uh, uh, HRAS, and then we have the double mutant MIC RAS. And so now what we want to do is to try and understand if the single phenotypes have any predictive value on the, on the double phenotypes. So just for information, these are mouse embryonic fibroblasts. Um, Two weeks uh, transfected two weeks after harvesting and uh, pen uh, penetration assay two weeks later. So these are all cancer cells we're pre predicted. Uh, now um, again, so we we now what we want to do is exactly the same thing as we did before. We want to extract features. So we take these images, we do all our pipeline of segmentation, and then we extract features. Now in this case, we use only twenty six. Um, and uh, uh, the idea is, can we obtain a predictive model of the double mutant morphology from single mutant uh, data? Now, the first thing that you do is, can these things map into a linear space? So, are, is the mu mutant HRAS and the mutant MIC so separated in this space from um, uh, one from the other, one to the other, then when we add them, they add linearly. So if one modifies the nucleus and the other modifies the mitochondria, we're gonna get a sum of the two. And so if that was the case, if that was the case, um, then what we will have is in this feature, this feature space, we'll, we'll be able to separate our uh, single, double, and control sets. But this doesn't happen. In fact, our, um, our, uh, uh, our uh, space in a linear, that's trying to separate in a linear fashion doesn't separate. So we cannot really, um, using information only from uh, single mutations, we cannot infer uh, the double mutations as a summation of the two. Summation in, in this morphological space, uh, of course. So what, what this means is basically that between, in this feature space, the relationship between the single mutant and double mutant is non-linear. There is no linear combination of uh, features in HRAS and features in MIC that map to uh, features in MIC-RAS space. I hope I'm being clear. I'm, I'm, I'm going very fast. This required a little bit more. But now, so, uh, all right, so I, I've already, I basically said this. So do, does it separate? It doesn't separate. Uh, so, okay, so again, now, Remember now the slide about m machine learning and deep learning. So machine learning assumes a model. In that case, we were assuming that there was linear separation between, that there was a linear combination of a, sing uh, of a single mutation into the double mutation space. What we're going to do now is to, we, we're not going to assume that. We're going to ask a neural network to learn what is the relationship between single mutant and double mutant, and then ask it to map that relationship back on the single mutant space so that we know what are the constraints of the, uh, of the separation. And so what we're going to do is to um, uh, train our network on cells that are not, not been modified, so uh, uh, empty transfection, and 
double mutant. And then we're going to ask, what are the conditions on the single mutant that uh, are related uh, to the double mutant? And, uh, and then we're going to extract that model. Um, so the neural network is a very simple two-layer network. If uh, any of you is more computer science in, uh, inclined, it takes a bunch of cells and uh, uh, it's binary. It, it tells you basically yes or no, and it has uh, these two class. And uh, just, uh, just for, for, for uh, confirmation, this is a, if you take a random composition testing of uh, a single mutant, this maps exactly uh, to the single mutant. Um, now, um, and, it, oh, and, and it does, uh, uh, um, it, it maps exactly to the single mutant. Now, what happens when we map it to the double mutant? Well, what happens is that um, the, the neural network is capable of inferring the relationship, the relationship between the, the, the two single um, uh, mutations and map them onto the, uh, the, double, um, uh, the, 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 the double mutation feature space. But we don't know that. We, we don't know because uh, I, uh, the neural network is a black box. What it's learning doesn't tell us. In order to understand the model, so in order to understand what are the conditions that um, we can use to map the, the single um, mutations and the double mutation, we need to do what is called unboxing. So we need to take this hidden layer and reverse engineer it so that it will tell us what are the input conditions that map to the, uh, to the output. And if we do that, and again, this is uh, too fast, what this is going to tell us is the what is the uh, actual mapping of the, uh, the double uh, mutant space onto the single mutant uh, uh, feature space, which is this one. What we're going to look for is, uh, are the rules uh, that are common uh, to all uh, three states. These are our design rules. So this means that basically, if we have a, an input, a, an input, uh, if we can build an uh, a, um, um, single, um, uh, if we can build a cell uh, that has a single input that is in this interval, then we can predict uh, the, the, what the output of the double mutant will be by uh, forward uh, modeling the, uh, the, the neural network. So if the single mutant are in, in this range for these specific features, and there is, a, there is a way of extracting the features, then our network is capable of predicting uh, what will be uh, the, uh, the, the double mutant uh, phenotype. This means that we can establish uh, design rules. So if we know this, then we, we go back and we take all the possible uh, morphologies, we, we, uh, we select them, and once we select them, once we select the, 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 those level of expressions, then we can generate morphologies that are specifically um, um, as, we, as we design them. Now, Oh, okay. So this is my last slide. So I'm gonna finish. Um, uh, and I no, I understand this part was this final part was a little bit more complicated, and I didn't have enough time to go into the details that was necessary. Uh, but so most of this work was done by my postdoc uh, uh, Beto, and I want to thank everybody in my group, five people, so not a, a huge group. Um, uh, but we are very fortunate to be part of the Center for Cellular Construction, which has over 200 people. Uh, that continuously stimulate us to, to look for a new solution, in particular the group of Wallace Marshall uh, and Zev Gardner. And all this will not be possible um, uh, without the, the support of the, the NSF. So I want to thank you for your attention. I'm sorry it was too long, uh, but there was a lot to talk about, especially the long introduction. That single slide made of 10 slides uh, was, not the, was not the best. And thank you again.